KPFA, KPFB Berkeley, KSCF 88.1 in Fresno. It's time now for Guns and Butter. This is Guns and Butter. The long-term patterns, the the experts picking the details at NASA, and just day-to-day observations of solar activity, they all point to this grand minimum coming very, very soon. And, you know, I'll just say that the best case scenario we can hope for is that we look back at the Maunder minimum, the last grand minimum. We see the the record cold temperatures. We see the droughts mixed with floods and famines. And we just try to think about how we can mitigate this as best we can. We, we just have to hope that the magnetic changes don't go to fruition, that they were just some sort of anomaly. I'm Bonnie Faulkner. Today on Guns and Butter, Ben Davidson. Today's show, The Other Side of Climate Change. Ben Davidson is an independent researcher into the science of climate change. His mobile observatory project travels across the United States and Canada, conducting research and presenting at schools, museums, and public venues. His short space news broadcast every morning at 6.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time is available at both his website and YouTube channel. He has been interviewed by the Thunderbolts Project and was a presenter at the Electric Universe 2014 conference in Albuquerque, New Mexico. He is the author of the article, Global Warming or Global Cooling? His YouTube channel, Suspicious Observers, explores the sciences of the sun, space weather, and its electromagnetic effects on the Earth. Ben Davidson, welcome. Hi. Is there a difference between the weather and the climate? Uh, certainly. Um, well, I guess the answer would be yes and no. You have your day-to-day weather, and then you have your long-term climate, but they're obviously uh, intimately linked, and um, you, know, you can see uh, short-term and long-term trends uh, on both a day-to-day and uh, a longer scale. So um, I guess, yes, there would be a difference technically. I guess essentially that the climate is a more long-term look at the trends. Right. Um, On this Sunday, November 2nd, the Associated Press released an article entitled, UN Climate Change Report Delivers Stark Warning. The UN's International Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, was set up in 1988 to assess global warming. Quote, The report released Sunday establishes with 95% certainty that most of the warming seen since the 1950s is man-made. The IPCC's best estimate is that just about all of it is man-made, but it can't say that with the same degree of certainty. And that's the end of the quote. In fact, how much global warming has there been since the 1950s? Well, uh... There was a bit, you know, quite a bit from 1950 uh, up until the turn of the century. uh, And you could actually go back to 1930s and, you know, start from there. But there are some interesting uh, reasons why that might be the case. And since about the turn of the century, there has been a plateau of temperatures, even though every indicator that the IPCC focuses on, like carbon dioxide or uh, carbon monoxide or um, water vapor in the atmosphere, all these all these greenhouse gases, while they still rise up exponentially, the temperatures have plateaued. And technically, since 1998, the, the great El Nino of 1998, um, the planet has cooled a little bit and has cooled uh, a number of times and in a number of different ways in the past decade or so. Is there a correlation between carbon dioxide, CO2 emissions, and temperatures on Earth? And if so, how much? Um, Infinitesimally small. You know, there was a pretty darn good matchup of the long-term levels of CO2 versus the temperatures in the atmosphere going back, you know, thousands and thousands of years. But something interesting happened during the Industrial Revolution. Um, The temperature started to go up slowly, 
but the CO2 skyrocketed and actually deviated from what was an otherwise fairly good match over thousands of years. And in recent times, we have seen more CO2 than in any other time in modern history, rising faster than in any other time in modern history. And the temperatures have done the exact opposite of what they thought it would do. How accurate have been the IPCC's climate predictions? Has the IPCC admitted failure in their climate predictions with regard to both temperature and rising sea levels? Uh, yes and no is the answer once again. They will still um, state that uh, they are pretty sure, and they only really make these statements on, on a long-term scale, but uh, they still state definitively that the planet is warming over the long term. And when you use their time frames, uh, yes, that is certainly true, although it might be a bit cherry-picking to use their time frames. But they have, uh, and you know, this is something you don't even need any scientific understanding or knowledge to do. All you got to do is know how to use Google or Bing or any kind of search engine on the Internet. If you Google IPCC admits no global warming, uh, it would take days to go through all the articles uh, from, you know, what was then the head of the IPCC uh, admitting that there hadn't been global warming for nearly two decades. And that would be the two decades we're in now. Another thing to Google would be the global warming pause. Uh, they have had to come up with now more than 40 different explanations for this pause in global warming, as they call it, over the last two decades. And the reason they have had to come up with so many is because every time somebody puts forth some explanation, they, they either debunk it quite quickly or they find it to uh, otherwise lack merit. And so we're still at a loss to describe not only the pause in warming, but some of the other changes that we're seeing on the planet, which, uh, which we can talk about in a bit. Now, you said a minute ago that CO2 is rising, but temperatures are not rising. Um, so what accounts for the CO2, the uh, carbon dioxide rising? Are we talking about uh, man-made carbon dioxide emissions? Yes, mostly. Okay. Now, what is the 97% consensus? Okay, well, first of all, uh, if we assume that a consensus exists, uh, over the past 20 years, it's been a pretty bad consensus. It means that just about uh, all of science got it wrong. But in terms of a consensus, what they're talking about is a few hundred people, and they only work for the IPCC. This is, you know, the scientists who, who contribute to the IPCC and other prominent uh, climate scientists who are writing about global warming. And the way they do this is they say uh, they only look at papers that are trying to explain global warming. And they look at whether or not they come down on the yes or the no versus uh, man-made effects. And essentially, um, for the most part, the consensus that has existed has stated that the climate is changing, that the planet had been warming for uh, quite a few decades, and that humans had an effect on the climate. Well, when you put it like that, it's kind of hard for anyone to deny it, even somebody who goes against a lot of what is being purported by the IPCC. Every input to a system is going to have an effect on the outcome. And to think that it, you know, humans would have no effect on the climate is quite laughable. But it doesn't change the fact that um, there needs to be questions asked and suspicion raised because now for just about two decades, their climate models have been utterly wrong. And that's because other than trying to model the creation of the universe, trying to model the climate on Earth is the second most difficult thing we've ever tried to do with math and a computer. And unless you have um, all of the inputs, everything that's possibly affecting the climate in there, and unless you have them tuned exactly how they will actually affect the climate and you know how they're going to react in the future, until you have all of that knowledge, uh, which would essentially be, you know, all the knowledge that there would be uh, to be had. Uh, until you do that, your models are going to be highly inaccurate, and that's what we've seen. Uh, and part of the goal of what we've been doing with our research is trying to figure out what is the big 
biggest chunk that they're missing? What could they add to these climate models that could give them a bit more uh, accuracy? Uh, while I go against, uh, and while most of the uh, observers go against um, the mainstream media's take on climate change, uh, we're not completely on the other on the other side. You know, most of the opposition to what the IPCC is saying says, oh, see, the, the temperature hasn't risen, so there's no climate problem and there's no need to regulate pollution. Well, first of all, pollution is bad for many reasons, uh, the climate not being the most of which, uh, but also there are very significant climate problems and most of them have a genesis off world. They start at the sun and there's evidence all throughout the solar system for them. Climate change is a very important topic and so we sort of stand in the middle of one side saying, oh see, this is no big deal and then tossing in the greed aspect when saying you don't need to regulate these big corporations in this big industry. But I also don't stand on the other side uh, calling anybody who questions the mainstream uh, what have become really political lines. I'm not calling anybody on the other side a denier or anything like that. This is really kind of deviated from a scientific discussion into a political one where you take polar opposite extremes and then you just stand your ground and refuse to move. It's turned into quite a bit of a circus, actually. What does the 2009 U.S. Senate report say? Uh, well, it says quite a few things, but essentially um, that was one of the first large-scale jolts of opposition to this alleged consensus on climate change. Um, getting back to that for a minute, that may have been highly cherry-picked, and it may not have actually um, been as much of a consensus as it's been made out to be. But the Senate climate report had actually more people um, writing in favor of questioning these long-held beliefs about man-made emissions and climate change. And it was the precursor to thousands of people, uh, you know, many thousands of people, I think an order of magnitude larger than the number that was used to come up with this consensus became part of the global warming petition project as well uh, although that hasn't gotten very much uh, play in the news unfortunately well I was going to just ask you about the global warming petition project what is that essentially this takes individuals who have um, training in science and they ask them to basically you know the scientific method you have a scientifically oriented mind take a good look at all the climate facts and come to a decision and that there are literally thousands of uh, scientists uh, and people in scientific disciplines all over the world that have uh, signed up for things like this but the global warming petition project was just in the united states and there were uh, many thousands of individuals that signed up uh, that signed that one unfortunately um what you have here is $27 billion going towards essentially one side of the climate story. It's a business big enough to be a major player on any stock market. And what makes that business run is basically what you've been hearing in the media the past uh, couple of decades now, that there's catastrophic global warming happening, although they've recently had to change the name to climate change, uh, given the lack of global warming, and um, that we're completely responsible for it. And the first part is partially true, and the second part is almost not true at all, even though I advocate for you know, some pretty solid regulation on pollution. We shouldn't just let them pollute whatever we want. Uh, I don't believe it has that much of an effect on climate change, and that's what we spent a great, great amount of time and effort uh, proving over the last uh, 18 months or so. Is it true that for the last 18 years, or, well, maybe perhaps since 1998, that the climate has not been warming? And if so, can you explain the pause in warming? Yes. Yes to pretty much all of those. Uh, the planet has actually cooled uh, since 1998. Since 2012, the planet has cooled. It goes through numbers of uh, short-term cooling trends like that. And if you look back to about 
1995 or 1996, it's right about where we are now. So we're basically at the exact same point temperature-wise, which is baffling because you keep hearing the news say, oh, this is the hottest August on record, hottest September, hottest this, hottest that. Well, the data doesn't really support that. You, know, you don't want to just come out and say it's blatantly lying, but uh, when you're following the data day in, day out, uh, as are the now 200,000 plus observers. Uh, it's quite clear what's happening here, how one thing is really going on and then another is being purported uh, to the public. I'm speaking with independent researcher Ben Davidson. Today's show, The Other Side of Climate Change. I'm Bonnie Faulkner. This is Guns and Butter. What is the single most influential cause of climate change? Uh, without question, the sun. Absolutely no doubt whatsoever, the sun. If I may, just in the past couple of years, there's been massive climate change throughout the entire solar system, and I'd like to share some of what that is with you. On Venus, the fastest winds have increased 33%. We've seen some bad storms on this planet that have been attributed to climate change, but we haven't seen anything like 33% stronger than the previous record storms. Uh, Venus has also slowed its rotation. Its day is growing longer. Uh, during the period before the global warming pause, when Earth was warming up quite quickly, Mars was actually warming up faster. Interestingly, Mars has uh, a lot more CO2 uh, than, than Earth does, especially locked in ice. Um, Mars has polar ice caps as well, but it's mostly actually frozen CO2. And that was melting and causing extreme, extreme rises in CO2. And yet Mars stopped warming as well recently. Jupiter, uh, the great red spot, the big red spot on Jupiter is actually dying. It's fading away. Red Jr. was born, and an entire planetary stripe of clouds just disappeared. Um, these are pretty major climate events on the planet Jupiter, uh, more so than anything we've seen large-scale or small-scale here on the planet Earth. We've been monitoring a superstorm that crops up every 30 years on Saturn. And we've been able to see this with telescopes now for a few hundred years. And it's literally like clockwork every 30 years. It comes and then we know how big it's supposed to be and how much of it we're supposed to see and how long it's supposed to last. But it just came 10 years early. It was about twice as big as they thought it was going to be and it lasted for far, far longer. To give you an idea, this would be like a Category 6 hurricane hitting the east coast of the United States on January 1st and lasting through May. It's just the kind of thing we haven't even begun to fathom here on this planet yet. Oh, and by the way, Saturn is also changing its rotation speed. Um, we also have evidence of massive climate change on the planet Uranus. For the first time ever, a couple of years ago, we were able to see the energy of the auroras on Uranus uh, with, with an Earth-orbiting satellite, I should say. And we've also subsequently noticed that the storm systems on Uranus are intensifying a lot more than we would expect them to be intensifying. So that's pretty much all the planets changing and pretty much all the planets changing even more than Earth is. Uh, so we have evidence of a solar system-wide shift. And, you know, I, I talk about this a lot, uh, you know, at meet and greets, at schools, museums, science centers, planetariums, and every once in a while I get a question, something to the effect of, well, how's our pollution getting all the way out there and causing climate change on Saturn? How's our pollution getting to Venus and causing climate change there? And of course, the answer is that it's not. Um, there has to be something else going on here that's causing climate change throughout the entire solar system, and that is the sun. What is a sunspot, and what is the significance of lower sunspot numbers? Well, um, a sunspot is an area where a magnetic field of the sun pokes in 
and arches back down into the surface. Uh, you'll always see one sunspot where it breaks through and then another sunspot where it connects uh, almost all the time. And it's slightly cooler there because there's not this uh, mixing and mashing of solar material on the surface. There's just this direct current of charged particles, and there's actually not as much interaction there most of the time. Uh, in terms of talking about the significance of lower sunspots, I have to back up a little bit. There is um, an 11-year sunspot cycle where we have high uh, levels of sunspot activity and then we have much lower levels of sunspot activity. And for one oscillation of the cycle to have a peak and to have a, uh, a minimum of activity takes about 11 years. Now, there is a longer cycle that we are beginning to understand called the grand solar cycle. And one of many individuals who are uh, who are trying to investigate this and look into it further is a man uh, called Arnab Rai Chowdhury. And I found uh, his research to be of the most convincing on the topic. About every 400 years, the sun goes through a grand cycle where just like the smaller 11-year cycles, there is a period of time when there's fewer sunspots or almost no sunspots and then there's a period where there's many many more sunspots and these last for 50 to 70 years in terms of the uh, grand minimum and the grand maximum now the last grand minimum was during the 1600s bleeding into the 1700s and this grand minimum was called the, the Maunder minimum for a team of scientists, husband and wife, who intimately studied this, this minimum. And something you'll want to keep in mind, they actually coined the phrase, the earth kills sunspots, because during the time they were watching this Maunder minimum, this grand minimum develop, there were sunspots that would come into view. And then it was as though as soon as they got to the point where they should be facing earth, they would decay. And then there was much more growth of sunspots or appearances of sunspots as they were departing the earth facing side of the sun, then were, you know, cropping up before they faced earth or while they were facing earth. So there was something going on where the sun didn't seem to want to point its, its sunspots at earth. Um, this is significant not just because we track the sunspot number, but because sunspots are what produce solar flares and the explosions from solar flares known as coronal mass ejections. These are the things that could uh, take out power grids and, as we are starting to find, might have uh, some impact on uh, storm activity and seismic and volcanic activity as well. But getting back to this whole sunspot cycle and the effect of having a lower number of sunspots. The 1600s was the, was the end of and the worst period of what's known as the Little Ice Age or the Mini Ice Age. It was a time of way colder than normal temperatures, a time of droughts, times of famine, times of disease, and it pretty much ended right when the grand solar minimum ended. And then for a few hundred years, the solar activity began to increase. And then right around 1930, the sun really kicked into gear. And the grand maximum of sunspot activity occurred from about 1930 to the late 90s. The strongest solar activity in hundreds of years took place exactly during the time of global warming. Now, when it ended, it ended very, very quickly. We're not talking about uh, a record of the past couple hundred years. As best solar scientists can examine via ice cores, petrified wood, and other geological means, the sun is now weakening faster than at any other time in the last 9,000 years. And that began literally within weeks of the time identified as the start of the global warming pause. 
You want to talk about the great global warming pause. Talk about the great global cooling coincidence. As soon as the sun began losing steam faster than at any other time in pretty much all of the time we can reconstruct using the evidence we have at hand, that is when the great global warming pause began, almost to a T. Now, since that time, some very interesting things have happened. The actual global average temperature has gone down slightly, but it has really been a story of climate extremes. So, for example, the eastern portion of the United States has been way, way below uh, normal. The western portion of the United States has had way above average temperatures, and that's spread north into Canada as well. In 2010 and 2011, Europe had phenomenally bad winters. The last two haven't been so bad, and it's looking like they might not get too bad a one this year. We have had shifts between record cold and record heat in Russia. And while the story has mostly been record heat uh, down under and in New Zealand and in uh, other parts uh, north to that in Asia, there have been some record cold events as well. And so there's this real dichotomy, uh, whereas the story was pretty much just the warming. Since the sun began losing its cool as well, there's been some stark trends in the polar ice. You keep hearing about, uh, oh, the, the ice is melting at the poles. The ice is melting at the poles. Well, as of this moment, the official numbers from the NSIDC, NOAA, and NASA show that the North Pole is very much recovered from its low point, which was hit back in 2012. In fact, where we are now is 50% higher than we were at this time in 2012. And that's pretty much been true all of all of this year. It's been a phenomenal recovery from a low point where they said that uh, we had reached the the runaway melting effect. This is going to speed up and speed up. Well, it hasn't sped up. In fact, ice is recovering in the north. Down south in Antarctica, we are at a record high amount of ice right now. We have been uh, setting daily, weekly, and we set an all-time record high this year when the ice peaked down south. And it's not even close. It is way, way above the, the times in the previous satellite age. All you hear about on the media is something about the western sheet of the Antarctica melting quite quickly. Well, the western sheet is melting quite quickly. It is quite small compared to the rest of Antarctica. And it's melting not from the surface, what's exposed to human emissions, but it's melting from underneath. And it just so happens that they have discovered massive erupting underwater volcanoes directly beneath the western ice sheet. And they've concluded this is now what's causing the melting. I'm speaking with independent researcher Ben Davidson. Today's show, The Other Side of Climate Change. I'm Bonnie Faulkner. This is Guns and Butter. You asked the question of what is the effect of lower sunspots. We're seeing a lot of the same things that happened during the last grand minimum, during the Little Ice Age. Not just starting to have cooler temperatures, but starting to see larger swings uh, in crazy weather as well. You see those climate extremes, which go beyond temperatures, but to storms as well. We've seen the strongest storm on Earth record broken, I think, five times in the last three years. Some areas are seeing record flooding. Others are seeing record drought, like the West Coast of the United States uh, and, and other portions uh, of the desert. And unlike the last time we had this happen, 400 years ago, uh, we are not as well prepared to to live off the land, to cope with, you know, a horrible growing season. You know, we weren't that far away last winter from losing orange crops in Florida due to snow and ice. We're not that far away from having a, a major June snowfall that goes down to Texas. 
and covers everything to the north of that, which means we can't be that far away from a major ice storm that takes out power for days to weeks, depending on how bad the roads are. And it's followed by temperatures that are well below not just freezing, but below zero, negative 10, negative 20, negative 30. That was a reality for people this past winter. Uh, luckily, the ice storms and the snowstorms that preceded them didn't leave too many of them without power, and they've got some backups in general. But people to the south of that don't when it starts happening in Ohio, in the Carolinas, in Tennessee. It's not going to be so easy to deal with. And when the sun fully goes to sleep because despite its rapid decline, it's coming off that highest point in 400 years. Uh, so it's taking a while. It's not fully snoozing yet. But when it does, we can expect the cold snaps. Uh, and this is going to come fast. And there's going to be uh, a terrible revelation, large scale, in this world. Because as I said, it's a $27 billion industry but not one cent goes to studying the cold. Have you ever heard of a property being lost to sea level rise? There has never been a property lost to sea level rise. There's been properties lost to hurricanes that said were, you know, affected the sea levels, but that's a little different. Uh, there is a naval site in Virginia that put in, in its request for funds, uh, to rebuild part of its dock, um, and one of the reasons given was uh, rising sea levels, but they didn't actually detect anything there that required them to do this immediately, and it, uh, I've heard from insiders that it was just a lot easier to get the money if they put that in the request. The real effect of global warming would be more farmland in Canada and Russia, less people starving, uh, less reliance on Monsanto. Uh, we should be so lucky. Unfortunately, that's not the case, and we're not prepared for it. We're not studying for it. We're not trying to learn when these things are going to happen, how bad they're going to be, what to do when one of these things does happen. That's that's our that's our main our main point with this with this climate stuff. For the most part, is climate change is a problem, but so is what people are saying about climate change. Not only do all the models have it wrong. And not only are the opposition to climate change jumping on those fallacies in order to say that climate change isn't a problem, um, and not only do we continue to see climate extremes on the planet, but we could see something completely um, unpredicted by most of the people talking about climate science right now. Have you ever heard of Climate Gate, Bonnie? Climate gate was something that I was sure was going to make people see what was going on. It had the folks that were basically in charge of the temperature data talking about how to make adjustments and manipulations to make the data fit their story because it really wasn't fitting their story. Uh, of course, that wasn't news for very long. It got covered up and forgotten about. And then it made news about Al Gore's conflict of interest, his his, uh, his heavy involvement with a group that would have profited incredibly from uh, trading carbon credits. Um, you know, these folks would have become some of the richest people in the entire world, you know, within just a matter of years. And they are pushing these, these things under the guise of public policy or uh, saving the planet or whatever. And then climate gate number two happened. They actually had more emails leaked from these uh, people running the data. Uh, Tony Heller over at Real Science exposed uh, some of these alterations of, of the temperature data. Some of them have been um, responded to with a no comment. Others have had pretty ridiculous explanations such as, oh, we had to move one of these monitors, so we had to adjust some of the data really fairly weak um, explanations for some of these things. Well, now, you've been uh, describing climate extremes that are happening presently. Was there evidence of this sort of uh, climate swings from hot to cold 
uh, leading up to uh, the grand solar minimum that you have been describing that was when, around 1650 to 1700? Is there any way of knowing that during that period they had these climate swings uh, leading up to what some people describe as the Little Ice Age? Well, you know, there is uh, there is some evidence for that. Now, granted, it's mostly in just historical accounts and some discussions uh, and records kept by farmers and things like that, which are much more local and are, are harder to rely on for making conclusions, but they do exist. But something interesting, the grand solar maximum that preceded the last solar minimum wasn't anywhere near uh, the solar maximum that we had this round. Uh, during this time of global warming, it was not only the highest solar activity of the last 400 years, but over the last 2,000 years at least, uh, and that was during the period of global warming. Uh, before the last grand minimum, the max just wasn't that uh, grand. Uh, it didn't have as far to fall we were already in a period of somewhat uh, global cooling in general, although the Maunder minimum capped it off uh, with a bang, so to speak. Um, so it, it's kind of a it's kind of a mixed bag. There is evidence of it, but then again, there's also a lot of evidence to suggest that things should have been a little different back then. We're coming off what is undoubtedly the highest solar activity in 400 and maybe 2,000 years, and now all of a sudden the sun is weakening faster than at any other time in the last 9,000. We're going to have a lot of clashing um, interests on the planet. You know, the oceans are still quite warm. We still have a lot of um, heating events. Uh, Earth's magnetism is actually changing quite a bit, and so that's another element um, to this entire situation that really nobody has touched on thus far. How important is the magnetosphere? And what is its function? Is that what you're referring to? Right. Uh, the magnetosphere, it's essentially this magnetic shell around our planet. And it protects us from radiation from the sun and radiation from the galaxy. And to distinguish between these two things is very important. The solar radiation tends to heat the planet. The radiation from the galaxy tends to be the kind that creates cloud condensation nuclei, uh, creates widespread white high cloud cover and reflects a lot of light cooling the planet. Uh, we are still waiting for them to reconcile that with their original statement that more clouds was the entire premise of the greenhouse effect and supposed to warm us, but that's another story for another day. Um, so it, keeping in mind this distinction, that the magnetosphere protects us from solar or heating radiation and galactic or cloud forming and cooling radiation. During the past 400 years, the magnetosphere has been weakening very, uh, very, very quickly. Uh, it started off slow and then it's been losing, losing its force in chunks. We are anywhere from 15 to 20 percent down on on Earth's magnetospheric strength at the moment. And so during this time of really, really high solar activity, um, we were getting a lot more of that heat energy than we were otherwise getting. And now that the sun has really kind of dropped off in activity, that exposes Earth to much more of the galactic radiation. Um, because as high, high solar activity actually acts as kind of a secondary shield around the entire solar system. But as that goes away, the energy from the galaxy encroaches in closer and closer and uh, in greater amplitude. And we don't have as strong a magnetosphere to deflect that away. And so uh, we are now getting the precise ingredient for cooling that we see more and more. And uh, we are indeed seeing this on the planet, the, the record colds that are being broken and um, the high cloud cover to go along with it uh, in a lot of areas. Well, what is making the magnetosphere uh, decrease in strength? Well, according to the European Space Agency, it is because the poles are flipping. And this is this is a, a completely 
uh, different, although not wholly separate, topic. The poles, uh, the magnetic poles, by the way, not the geographic poles. There's the geographic north and south, uh, the top and bottom of the of the Arctic and Antarctic. But there's also magnetic poles of Earth, and um, this has been the subject of everything from uh, articles in magazines to big time Hollywood movies. What happens uh, if Earth's poles were to flip magnetically? And the question is raised because we have evidence that this has not only happened many times in the past, but based on how often it appears to happen in the past, we are way, way, way overdue for it, um, like thousands of years overdue for one. Uh, and it's a pretty good cycle. Um, essentially, a couple hundred years ago, the poles were very, very stable. They had been sitting in northern Canada for a while. Now, the poles go on little journeys around the polar regions every couple of hundred years, and it doesn't always mean that there's a reversal uh, or a magnetic shift happening. Uh, oftentimes, it'll just meander around, and then it'll just kind of stop and settle in a new place. But what we know is that in times in the past where there is more than just this meandering around the polar regions uh, of the actual magnetic pole itself, during an actual reversal, we see a simultaneous weakening of the magnetosphere. And that is, by the way, what we were just talking about and what we see now. And the concern is that the pole seems to be racing faster now than it has at any other time on record. Um, the North Pole spent most of the last few hundred years in northern Canada, uh, the North Magnetic Pole, I should say. And it has now broken into the Arctic Ocean and is racing towards Siberia quite quickly. The South Pole, uh, the South Magnetic Pole, has left uh, the land and ice known as Antarctica and has entered the Indian Ocean basically where the Indian Ocean meets the Southwest Pacific. And the poles are shifting now with the magnetosphere shifting as well. So this is, um, you know, this has got to play some role in the climate for sure. But at the same time, this is much, much different. You know, when you're talking about these climate extremes, yeah, it's going to be bad, especially with the way that we grow and ship and store food all around the planet and how we're not very sustainable or self-reliant when it comes to a, um, a bad global situation. I'm speaking with independent researcher Ben Davidson. Today's show, The Other Side of Climate Change. I'm Bonnie Faulkner. This is Guns and Butter. Let me ask you a dumb question here. When we talk about uh, magnetic poles shifting, what is shifting? Is the Earth moving or just these magnetic uh, it's points? Just, it's just the magnetic points. Yeah, right. So it, we're not talking about the Earth moving. No, but it's um, it could be just as bad. Um, you know, like I was just saying, despite how bad it would be now, uh, to have another Maunder minimum or another grand solar minimum and mini ice age. Um, during the last one, people crossed the Atlantic and made 13 colonies here. Stuff gets done. It's not the end of the world. You get a pole shift in magnetospheric weakening, and you're getting a lot closer to that realm because then as the magnetosphere weakens down to maybe 20 10 or even 5% of the total strength, which would be, you know, losing most of it, then you have solar and cosmic radiation coming in in large amounts. You have the space weather effects. By space weather, I mean the way that the activities on the sun, like sunspots, solar flares, and other things like that, affect um, Earth those begin to have larger effects on the planet, and that goes for every level of the atmosphere right down to the ground, the power grids, and earthquakes and volcanoes as well. If that happens, you have large-scale shifts in how the air moves. We have done a lot of experiments uh, that basically uh, merge together uh, magnetohydrodynamics and meteorology, and we showed how a pole flip would have pretty wild effects on our weather, and they may even affect ocean currents to the point where there is large amounts of disruption uh, in the flow of water in the oceans, causing 
uh, essentially causing global tsunamis. Not to mention the fact that uh, you have a very good chance of losing GPS. Everything about GPS goes away um, because your poles have flipped. Uh, there are no correct, uh, correctly numbered runways at airports. Um, trucking, trains, pretty much most of commerce would have to um, either shut down for a little bit or come to a slow crawl while it figured stuff out. You're talking about one of the worst case scenarios. Now, there's a very good chance that that's not going to occur in our lifetimes. There's also a very good chance that it might. Um, recently, uh, Berkeley came out with a study that showed that these polar reversals can happen in the span of only 80 years, less than a human lifetime at their quickest. And we're already um, at that point, uh, about 80 to 100 years, in terms of the poles shifting and the magnetosphere weakening. In fact, the magnetosphere weakening goes back a lot further than the poles shifting. And so it's all a question of, well, is it going to slow down and stop and this will just sort of be an anomaly? Or is this going to continue doing what it's doing? And are we going to hit a tipping point and we're going to have that magnetic reversal? I am far more confident of what the sun is going to do than of what Earth's magnetics are going to do. I recognize the pattern of what's happening with Earth's magnetosphere and Earth's poles. And yes, if the pattern doesn't change, then we are not lifetimes away from this magnetic reversal. It's going to be a couple of years to a couple of decades at most away. But I'm almost certain that the signs on the sun are indisputable. NASA has seen them since 2006. They talked about the global conveyor belt of the sun shutting down, and we're going to have some very, very low amounts of solar activity. The National Solar Observatory has said that sunspots could disappear soon and persist that way for a while. And all of this without looking at those long-term scales like the grand solar cycle. This is just looking at the day-to-day -day and intimate interactions on and within the star itself. They see it shutting down, and that's what we, that's what we do. We, we monitor this every day, um, literally every day. No weekends, no holidays. My show comes out on the Internet. Uh, it's one of the most watched space weather programs on the Internet. And since 2011, we have noticed the Earth kills sunspots. The reason why that isn't a mainstream science term now is because as soon as the last grand minimum ended, it ceased to be true. The Earth didn't kill sunspots anymore. And so since, you know, over the last 300 years or so, it sort of faded out of, um, sort of faded out of use and even understanding. And, um, people, most scientists aren't even aware of it. But we started to see the exact same thing happen in November of 2011. The long-term patterns, the the experts picking the details at NASA and just day-to-day -day observations of solar activity, they all point to this grand minimum coming very, very soon. And, you know, I, I'll just say that the best case scenario we can hope for is that we look back at the Maunder minimum, the last grand minimum. We see the the record cold temperatures. We see the droughts mix with floods and famines and we just try to think about how we can mitigate this as best we can we, we just have to hope that the magnetic changes don't go to fruition that they were just some sort of anomaly well now with regard to these poles is is the earth like a giant magnet how does that work right the earth is basically a giant sphere magnet so is the sun and so are most planets and a lot of moons as well. Um, there's a lot of discussion uh, and some questioning of long-held beliefs about where uh, Earth's magnetism comes from. But what we do know is that there is a bundle of magnetic field lines coming out of the north and a bundle coming out of the south. And they wrap around the entire planet and we know that at times throughout history, they have completely reversed. And this has been um, tied to many mass extinctions on the planet in history. 
We also know for a fact that we are way, way overdue. And we know that these things can happen quickly and that we could be in the process of one now. Um, in terms of what the everyday person would need or want to know, that is about what you'd want to know as well. Um, it's a lot harder to prepare for something like that than it is for just about anything else. But yeah, the earth is very much like, like a magnet. Um, instead of like a, a bar magnet where you've got a north side and a south side or a positive side and a negative side, it's a sphere. And the, the axis shows you where the north and south is. And what I mean by that is, you know, earth is rotating, it's spinning. And if you could basically put a big metal rod through the geographic north and geographic south pole, you could essentially do that and have that rod stay there and the earth would still spin around it. That's called the axis. And that's where the polar magnetic fields come out, or basically the magnetic poles of earth. But sometimes they reverse. Uh, and that's what we're talking about right here. And as they reverse, they seem to lose strength, which is exactly what we see on the sun uh, in something that really doesn't pose any danger to humans whatsoever or to Earth. The sun reverses its poles every 11 years. Now, a couple of things happen. You know, once every sunspot cycle, the solar poles flip. And when that happens, that's when you get the majority of the sunspots, the majority of the solar flares and the solar storms that I was talking about earlier. That's when things are very, very chaotic on the sun. And then the fields reverse and things get less chaotic and they go back to being a little more quiet. During the time when the solar fields are reversing, they weaken considerably, almost down to nothing before flipping. So we see a lot of corollaries uh, from climate to um, the inner magnetic properties of Earth uh, really being tied to the sun here. And how is it that uh, sunspot activity, solar flares, coronal mass ejections, that when that activity is more intense or more prolific, that there's a corollary between that and the climate on the Earth? So that are you saying then that when there's more sun uh, spot activity, the climate on Earth tends to be warmer? Well, precisely. Um, but it's not just sunspot activity. You're talking about ultraviolet light, extreme ultraviolet light, X-ray emission with solar flares. You're talking about um, ropes of energetic particles and plasma on the solar surface that are 100,000 miles long, erupting into space, often sweeping right past Earth. You're talking about billions of tons of charged material ejected from a solar flare. Um, you're talking about what NASA describes as magnetic portals. Another thing that you can Google, and I promise it's not as science fiction as it sounds. It's quite scientific and it's quite complex. There are these magnetic portals, these electric flux lines that tie the planets to the sun tie the planets to each other and tie the planets to their moons. You know, the sun has one of these magnetic shells as well. The Earth's is called the magnetosphere. The sun's is called the heliosphere. The sun's polar magnetic fields wrap from the sun out past Pluto. So we are actually orbiting the sun within its polar fields, within its magnetic fields. We are connected in ways that you can't begin to imagine. Now, in addition to seeing the wealth of evidence of just the different ways the sun affects us, we can't say for certain all the mechanisms and how much they have an effect on the climate, as well as we can notice the patterns. During the last grand minimum, we were in the mini ice age. During the highest solar activity for 400 and maybe 2,000 years, we were having global warming. And literally, as soon as the sunspot activity stopped, as soon as it began descending on a rapid decline, we have the global warming pause, literally within weeks. Then it has lasted. 
We can see the pattern a lot more than we can understand all the intimate little details. I wouldn't want to speak with certainty on those. That's what the IPCC does when they try to speak with certainty on the climate without having an intimate knowledge of exactly, of not just what all the pieces are, but how they fit and how big of a piece they are, how important they are to the entire puzzle. So now the grand maximum that you've mentioned, the age of global warming, we were talking about, what, uh, a good part of the 20th century, is that right? Yeah, about 1930 to the end of the 90s. And then is it true that that the last decade began cooling faster than in the last 9,300 years? Um, we may have had some some cooling periods in the last you know, 9,000 years that uh, correspond with it. But we've definitely, we've definitely not seen anything like this since global warming started. You know, global warming was pretty much a, a rocket ship that was taking off with not only CO2, but with solar activity as well, up to extremely high levels. And the CO2 kept right on going up, but the sun stopped and then the temperature stopped rising and actually began cooling. What do you think is the most important thing for people to understand about the climate? The most important thing for people to understand about the climate is that it is a significant issue. The climate is changing not just on Earth but throughout the entire solar system and you can't blame that on our pollution. The sun has correlations with the climate that are long-term, short-term, and they're far better than any of the ones um, involved with greenhouse gases. If you Google things like IPCC admits no global warming, uh, you'll start to see what's been happening on the planet the last 20 years or so. You can follow the official data from any number of sources and see how it matches up, or should I say doesn't match up, with a lot of what we can honestly call political propaganda that is seen in the mainstream media. We are much more likely to see devastation from cold or extreme storm activity than we are from global warming or sea level rise. And some very prominent individuals, uh, people who have ended up quitting the IPCC, uh, prominent climatologists like John Christie at the University of Alabama Huntsville they're doing their best to try to get the word out and to try to get um, some more awareness for the other side of the climate story but as we stand there is no study no preparation being done for these cold events that could be coming Ben Davidson thank you very much thank you Bonnie I've been speaking with Ben Davidson Today's show has been The Other Side of Climate Change. Ben Davidson is an independent researcher into the science of climate change. His mobile observatory project travels across the United States and Canada, conducting research and presenting at schools, museums, and public venues. His short space news broadcast every morning at 6.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time is available at both his website and YouTube channel. He was a presenter at the Electric Universe 2014 conference in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and is the author of the article, Global Warming or Global Cooling. He is the co-founder of the E3 Media Group and has worked professionally in due diligence in venture capital and law. Visit his website at suspiciousobservers.org. That's suspiciousobservers.org with a zero instead of the letter O and observatoryproject.com. His YouTube channel, Suspicious Observers, explores the electromagnetic interactions between the sun and the earth. Today's program was produced by Bonnie Faulkner and Tony Rango. To make comments, order copies of shows, email us at faulkner at gunsandbutter.org. That's F-A-U-L-K-N-E-R at G-O-N-S-A-N-D B-U-T-T-E-R dot O-R-G. Visit our transitional website at gunsandbutter.org to sign up for our email list.
Follow us on Twitter at G and B Radio. That's G A N D B R A D I O.